All right, thanks, Taylor. Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I can't believe we're in fall webinar season. It's so weird. It's fall. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I have a lot to go through, so I'm just going to kind of dive in. Um, I wanted to share a bit about me. I have started gardening in high school, um, and I started doing design and teaching classes probably about 20 years ago. I personally have never taken a design or horticulture class in my life, and my passion is to really make gardening accessible to people. I think that there's an intimidation factor that's unfortunate. Um, all my learning has been experiential, so trial and error has been um, incredibly valuable. I still kill plants. Um, it happens, and I'm always learning the environment of my garden or any one garden, so don't let that disappoint you. Um, learn from it, and yeah. Uh, so I've never taught this class before, and when I was thinking about how to present it, I just thought maybe the best way is to talk with you kind of like I do in consultations. So I'll just sort of run through the bullet points that that I do when I do design consultations. <clears throat> I'm the department manager for Slope Garden Center, by the way, the design department manager. So I've been doing design through Slope for 20 years. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if this is going to last like a half an hour or two hours, honestly. <laughs> I'm just going to dive in. OK. Um, so the first thing that I say in every consultation is the 70% of the garden is the stuff you don't see. It's the soil, the fertilizer, and the water. And this is really critical for you to understand going into your fall planting project, whatever you're doing. This is something that it's worth noting and doing every year. So compost needs to, or, or soil amendment needs to be added to your soil every year, at least once a year. You have to imagine that the plants are constantly uptaking nutrients, and so it needs to be replenished. Soil has really become, from my point of view, more critical in the last, I would say, five years or so, or really identifying how garden health and overall plant health starts with the soil. And it's a really more holistic approach to your garden. It helps the plants take up nutrients better. It helps them be more resistant to bugs and diseases. It helps them be more drought tolerant. So 100% soil health is critical for the success of your garden. Um, when I say amend your soil, typic the best time to really do an amendment would be anywhere from like mid-September all the way through up until like Valentine's Day. So we really get that good soil in and sort of working in um, while the rains are coming and whatnot, and that'll sort of percolate down. Um, irrigation is also something that I note at every consultation. It needs to be assessed every year, no matter what. So um, if you just moved into a new house, definitely have the irrigation assessed. If you lived at, at somewhere for a long time, the irrigation needs to be assessed. What happens is, is that sediment builds up in the pipes a lot, and so that needs to be flushed out. Um, also, animals can come and break the tubes. The plants are growing, so a lot of times the water needs to be adjusted and the emitters need to be adjusted. So again, this is a checkoff point in your garden to just make sure that everything's running efficiently and effectively. Um, and then fertilizer. So a lot of consultations that I go on, um, people have gardeners that will come and take care of their garden every year or so, or I mean, once a month or two. And we don't know if they're fertilizing. And a lot of consultations that I go on, really, I look, I look at everything and it's like, wow, this would be an entirely different picture if this had been properly maintained over the last three years. And by properly maintained, it's the soil, the fertilizer, and the water. Um, pruning does have something to do with it, but it's not, I mean, it's a lot more critical that those three other three things are lined up. So um, talking with your gardener, making sure that 
fertilizer is being applied, just as homeowners being aware of these three things is going to be important for your success going forward. Um, okay, so what I just what I would suggest next is to really assess your space. Um, the best thing to do is to edit out anything that is not working for you. There's no point in trying to, you know, deal with a struggling plant that's been struggling for years and whatnot. It's just time to get rid of it. Um, and what that does is we can see the space more clearly. We can see where we need to add plants. Um, it can sort of, sort of shift the energy of the garden if you're going to take out a tree or whatnot. And so we can really get a sense of where we need to fill and what we need to prioritize in terms of new plants. Um, in this particular garden, this is a garden um, that I came into and it was looking like this when I came into it. Um, and this is just an example of, and I'll show it on the next slide, what we turned it into, but in this particular garden, this entire back uh, tier was filled with ivy and a row of trees. And so the clients wanted to take the trees out, wanted to clean the ivy up and wanted to just have a complete different fresh look in the front garden. And so we edited out at first. So we, we took the trees out, we took the ivy out and it really just opened everything up. And we were like, okay, let's look and see what we wanna prioritize and, um, and how we wanna work with what we wanna keep. So this is that same garden, this picture here. And like I said, we took out all those trees along the fence line there, which um, increased the amount of sun. And so we were able to incorporate uh, things like lavender and roses and stuff like that that could take more sun that we wouldn't have been able to do before. Um, when you do that, when you clear it, when you when you sort of look at the space and you sort of clear it and, and see where you want to fill, it's also a really good time to assess your overall goals for the space. Um, most people, most consultations that I go on, people want drought tolerant, want low maintenance. A lot of people want natives incorporated in their garden, which is great. Maybe you have a pet or you want it to be kid friendly. Um, those are just all sort of check off points that will help narrow down your sort of plant palette and just help it be more um, accessible to you instead of as overwhelming. Um, and then climate is really important to consider too. So how much sun do you have and how long do you have it is pretty critical in identifying the plants that'll work for you. Um, full sun is considered usually five hours or more and part sun is between three and five hours and then um, low, you know, uh, shade is less than that. Um, also, time of the day depends. So morning sun is less intense than afternoon sun. So if you have four hours or three hours of afternoon sun, you could technically get away with planting some full sun plants um, because the afternoon sun is more intense, if that makes sense. So really watch the sun, watch how it works through your garden and what time of the, of the day. And that's going to be helpful information. Um, and also what kind of soil do you have? Is it well draining? Is it clay? Is it loam? Um, that's something to keep in mind going forward. There's certain plants that definitely need good drainage. There's other plants that are fine in clay soil. So just Gathering that information up is going to make you uh, have a better sense of what's going to work well in your garden. Um, and wind is a big factor too. So there's a lot of plants that can withstand wind better than others. And so watch that and, and watch um, how it works through your garden. That's something to also consider if you want to block the wind in any way or sort of uh, what's the like reduce it, you know, we can put a screen up and that can help reduce the wind. Hey, hey, Jeff, I have a quick question to kind of jump in here as you're on the considerations. Um, 
We had someone asking about soil health. And I think just, it's a, like you mentioned, it's one of the most important things to really talk about. And they were mentioning that they actually have soil tester kits and they have those kinds of soil testers and kind of wondering maybe what they should look into if they are trying to use that and maybe some other kind of ideas of how to assess their soil to then properly amend it. Well, I personally have never used a soil tester kit. Have you? I have unfortunately not used the soil tester kit. Um, <laughs> okay. So I know that both of us have, don't have the best um, idea of on the full scope of what they are, but I've had people yeah. use them. And it tells you about the, the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium and stuff like that. So it kind of gives you a bit of information. But I think what we tend to do and what I think we are keying into is just kind of through feeling and water and more how you actually approach the soil, you kind of learn a lot more about what the soil might need. And maybe your thoughts on like when you go to an area, what you look at the soil for? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and we and definitely look at our um, our video uh, library because we we do a deep dive into soil in a couple of classes that you can check out. But I would just say, for me, on a simple level, what you know, when you water, does the water go straight through the the soil or does it kind of puddle up? Um, that's a quick thing that'll tell you, like either you'll, you have sandy soil or you have more clay soil. And um, in both cases, amending the soil is still critical. So no matter what, you're gonna be adding that compost and that amendment and stuff like that. So that's just across the board. Another thing to consider um, to narrow down your plant choices is what kind of garden do you want? Um, contemporary, traditional, native, Mediterranean, pollinator. These are all key words that you can put into like a Pinterest search or a Google images search. Um, you can put that in and it'll sort of generate ideas for you based on those, those uh, that type of garden. And that's, I think, really helpful to make sort of an inspiration board and narrow down what kind of plants you want to incorporate. So this garden here we did, this is in San Francisco and this client wanted a more traditional garden, which traditional to me is a lot of boxwood and roses and um, uh, flower, you know, ferns and flowers and things like that. So this is a little bit more of a high maintenance garden than something like a native garden or Mediterranean garden. But I, you know, I still really like how it turned out and the client, this is exactly what the clients wanted. And so, and you just have to weigh that out <clears throat> with yourself and in your own garden, um, what you're looking for. Um, okay, so this is, a. I wanted to bring this up because I think I talk about this in nine out of 10 consultations. Um, if you're looking to replace a lawn, what I would stress you to consider is price per square foot. And price per square foot would be anywhere from, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're replacing the lawn with a drought tolerant plant, that's gonna be anywhere from $8 a square foot to like $50 and up, depending on what size, what type of plant that you're using. And what I've been encouraging a lot is native sod. The, this is uh, three different examples of gardens that I've done incorporating native sod. And the native sod is $2.80 a square foot. Um, so what I would say is to consider it for a couple of reasons. One, obviously price, but two, um, it's a visual resting place for your eyes. So if you can imagine if you're taking out an entire lawn and you're replacing it with like 50 different plants, it can look cluttered at a certain point depending on how you do it. So I think visually it's really nice to have sort of just a green space, like a green blob of something that is just that visual resting spot. Um, and it, it can be, so the native side can be, you can have it be like a meadowy look so it, it's just like tufts of grass or you can um, mow it. So it has like more of a traditional lawn look like this, this, this lower one here. So this is obviously, this is more traditional with these boxwood globes, but we incorporate, incorporated native lawn. So you can have a combination of it. 
the native sod is more drought tolerant. It's equivalent to any other drought tolerant plant once it's established. It has a deeper root system and whatnot. And so um, definitely something to consider. These are from Delta Bluegrass. I put the link here. And with Delta, you can order that through Slope or um, directly through Delta. Okay. So planning your planting. Um, I would say the first thing is to determine your budget because everything's gonna fall in line after that. Um, if you're approaching your fall garden and you're like, look, I have like a $500 budget. Um, what are the priorities for you? Uh, do you need to put, do you need a screen in? Do you need a tree in? Um, do you want some perennial color? Um, because that is going to be a good starting point to what you're going to tackle first. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I think it's much easier to add in, in a garden than subtract. And so if you sort of prioritize your areas and start with the most important and go from there, it might make it easier to um, sort of conceptualize and um, tackle, if that makes sense. So, and then any, if you are gonna do any hardscaping, all of that should be done first. It's just <clears throat> any hardscaping and this hardscaping is like this. This is the path that was in that, garden before that I showed you. So so we did all the hardscaping first. You want to do that first because uh, basically the plants get trashed during any um, hardscaping project. <laughs> Same with this one up here. We did all of these um, stone, these concrete pavers first and had that all laid out before we added the plants. So all hardscaping should be done first. Okay, design tips. Um, <clears throat> and I know this is kind of subjective, but I'm just gonna say what I sort of would encourage you to think about. Uh, when you're looking at your garden and say you've done your editing and whatnot, and you're looking at what's working, I would definitely suggest repeating what is working. Um, it makes, the space feel more intentional. It makes it feel more cohesive. If you're bringing a plant through that same space, it just, it ties it all together much better. Plus, you know, it works. So there's a big reason to repeat it. Um, and I think less is more. You make more impact with less plants. So if you do sort of islands of plants and repeat that through the space, it just makes a lot more impact and it looks a lot more intentional, like I said. Um, okay, so odd numbers. Um, I think most people have heard like, it's better to do odd numbers of things. Um, and I, I agree, I would encourage you to uh, plant in threes or fives or sevens, but also look through the space and repeat in odd numbers. So. You can do like a triangle. Um, it's kind of hard to, so so this, these are the same garden. Um, this is when it was first planted. And this, this is when it was grown in a bit, but I wanted to kind of show it because we repeated the, the grass texture. So it's down here, it's up here and it's over here. So there's, it's repeated three times or there's some over here and some like it's repeated throughout the space in an odd number. Um, here, if you look up closer and so we have some grass here and then there's another patch over here. So this is just, we're creating that sort of triangle of grass. So here, here, and then going up there. Um, same with the globes. These are pittosporum golf ball globes, which are great. Um, and this is just something that is really fun to repeat and uh, you know carry through the space. <clears throat> you don't necessarily need to repeat the same plants to have that consistency, but 
repeating that same uh, either color or shape is really critical. So if it's a grass, having that vertical element uh, throughout the space is important. If it's a, um, a leaf color, like say if it's like burgundy, a burgundy leaf tone or a chartreuse leaf tone or something like that, having that repeated um, throughout the space in, in odd numbers is really what helps tie it all together. Um, again, like I said, it's easier to add than subtract. So just start prioritizing, put in the tree. The fall is the, so right now and through like the end of November is the best time to plant in the Bay Area. And the reason being is that the ground is still warm and the air is cool. So the plants tend to uh, trans transition easier. There's less insects and diseases. And plus you get the plants in before the rains start. And so that helps offset the water budget a bit. And so if you're thinking about putting in a tree or if you're thinking about putting in a hedge, now is the time to do it and prioritize that. Um, and then go from there. Uh, and then I always like, and I'm in, I've been in this kick for maybe like the last three years, but I, I, I'm, I'm just so like in the last, however many gardens I've done in the last three years, I'm like, you know what, this needs a boulder. Um, <laughs> because I just think it's a fun add to the garden. It takes up space, it's easy. They're not super expensive. Um, and it gives it that element that feels like a bit more designery. So incorporating boulders or bird baths or even a cute bench or something, that just helps take the space and give another element to everything. Yeah. Can Thank I uh, throw some another little note into there? I don't have a question mm -hmm. at the moment, but I really like these pictures that you're showing right now because another mm -hmm. thing that is really showing is the, uh, the growth that the plants grow through. And I think that's very yeah. obvious for everyone. We all understand that plants grow. But I think a lot of times when people plant their gardens, they um, it's really easy, especially because when we talk about planting a planter, we always say like, fill it up. But when you're planting a garden, if you fill it up too much, things really do grow in. And it's showing how your your pittosporums and your grasses and your like the, I think it's either like the lissum or some sort of little white flower, they mm -hmm. really filled in the space and you're able to plant a little bit less, but more spread out in this kind of pattern that really fills in quite quickly and understanding that that process that happens. Um, I think it's a good thing for everyone to understand while they're designing their garden. It's true. And like, if to be honest, like I, I think I'm, I personally like a full look both in the containers and in the garden. So, I mean, this exact garden, we could probably have done half the plants if you like a lot of space around your plants. Um, but this client, you know, wanted that full look and, and whatnot. And so we, everything sort of goes together, but it has its own, you can, you can see it's got its own form too. So it just depends on what you like. You can always start with three and add another two, you know, down the line, if it, if you feel like it needs to, um, be more full or whatever, like I said, you can always, it's easier to add. Um, I think that, do I have? Yeah, no, that's okay. That's the end. So it was like a half hour. Perfect. Um, Wonderful. but I do want to go over, um, some, some resources, obviously slow, like Taylor and I were saying, there's a, a literally, I think, you know, over a hundred some videos on, on slow on the, on our YouTube and on our um, website that goes into a deeper dive on a bunch of this stuff. So like deeper dive on water, um, soil, um, pests and diseases, uh, native plants, it's whatever, it's all on there. Um, and then I want you, I want to highly, highly encourage you to check out Calscape's website. It's, um, it's, uh, a native plant. It's for it. California is the only one that has this type of website and it's absolutely incredible. Like it's I'm obsessed brilliant. with it. Actually, yeah, it's I do brilliant. suggest just going on to it. <laughs> Go on it and, and and it's all native plants and you can check out, you can do a search and you can check off if you, you know, how tall you want the plant to be, if you want to attract hummingbirds, what color flower you want, how much sun you have, like you can put, you can check off a bunch of boxes and it generates a list that, that will um, qualify for your, under your checkpoints.
It also has a, um, a design feature. So you can put in your square footage and what sort of garden you want, and it'll generate a design plan for you, which is pretty incredible. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, and then of course, Delta Bluegrass, like I was saying for the native side, um, there's they have a few different varieties of native sod. The only one that I've personally used over and over again is the Nomo native sod, which even though it's called Nomo, you can mow it. Um, for a more traditional look. And I actually recommend mowing it like three or four times a year just to keep it looking fresh. Um, and then Monrovia is uh, a company that we buy a lot of our plants from at Slope, but I really like their website because in the search, you can search under certain categories. So you can search for shade plants or sun plants or um, conifers or, you know, whatever. It, it, there, the search engine is really good on there too. So I hope yeah. all of that helps. <laughs> Definitely. No, I think it was a really nice kind of like intro to how you should approach when you're actually trying to design your garden. And when you're talking to a designer like yourself, um, the questions that they might ask you and the questions that you should be ready to kind of go forward with um, instead of just being completely blank uh, minded on like, well, I just need a garden fixed, you know, like maybe what you're actually going for. Uh, I want to touch on a little bit of these websites before I kind of get in. I have a few questions or so. Um, uh -huh. Definitely the Monrovia website. I, I'm one of the nursery buyers for our company, for our store here in San Francisco. And uh, I find that the Monrovia website is actually really helpful to really see good, uh, fairly live and actually very recent video, uh, pictures of a lot of their plants. And it also gives you an idea of what's a little bit more available right now. And even if you really want something very specific and sometimes we can't bring it into our stores, they actually have it available for you to buy and actually send it to our stores and pick it up here. So sometimes you can find some really cool little plants that you can uh, even purchase yourself and we can facilitate that for you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I love Calscape. It's, it's a really cool website, especially if you're into native plants, like what a, what a wild resource that we actually have available to us. So um, seriously. Um, and also our Slope Gardens website. Um, I know we don't have a live stock of our stores on the website because it would be impossible for us to <laughs> achieve that. But it does have a great um, in intro and history of all of our different kinds of plants and sometimes pottery and sometimes uh, all of our videos and stuff that we have going up. So it's a cool website to actually um, move through and get some good ideas. Uh, I have a question. Thank you very much, Allison, for bringing in some wonderful questions today. Um, and she was mentioning, or they were mentioning that you were saying to plant sometimes uh, larger trees, especially, but plants later on in November, which I think is just the idea of maybe planting in later fall. What actually does that do for your uh, landscape going forward? And why would you do that? Oh, I, I just meant that like mid-September through November is the primary uh, planting time. So anytime in there is good. Um, and what it does is, like I said, the, the ground is still warm, so it encourages the roots to start spreading out and taking hold um, faster. And then we're also getting it in, you know, hopefully before we get a ton of rain and that helps offset the, um, the water budget a bit. Oh, I forgot to say, uh, so drought tolerant and native gardens are only considered drought tolerant once the plants are established is really important so and the plants take eight to 12 months to get established so if you're going and you're planting a ton of native plants and drought tolerant plants and you just think that you'll get through the winter and then you won't have to water next year it's not going to work out <clears throat> they need to they need to have that regular water for a year so starting now I mean like I said you'll hopefully we'll have rains through I mean this year we had them through like what April or May or something but so we'll have rains for, you know, a few months that'll help offset that what water budget. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And um, I think it's commonly talked about in the planting world that fall is the time to plant. But we are in a temperate environment and especially here in our kind of California coastal area. Um, you can plant any of the plants that we have in our store all year round. There are sometimes better seasons that they may take off a little bit better or might be a little bit easier on you. Um, but in general, um, yeah, fall is a great time to plant. And also it, it actually coincides with uh, something coming up. I did want to mention during this is we have our fall 
sale coming up for our Sloat stores. So all of our Sloat stores across the Bay Area on September 29th, 30th, and uh, I think November 1st, if that's the right month kind of switch over. Um, we're at the very end of this month. We have 25% off all of our nursery stock. That's one gallon and larger, 25% off. A wonderful deal to really get your garden started for fall. Um, it's a We're going to bring lots of cool plants. You're going to be able to get some really nice deals and actually get some cool stuff for your garden. So if you're interested in thinking about planting for fall, uh, check out the very end of September. If you're not watching this in the future, if you're watching this in the future, look for other sales coming up. But <laughs> if you're watching it right now, <laughs> we have a sale coming up pretty soon. <laughs> um, I have a few other kinds of questions that are here and there kind of coming in. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're coming to the end. Um, but... I think this kind of mentioned with um, what's the best season to plant citruses. And actually I wanted to kind of mention that that is something that we are going to be, we have many uh, citrus uh, webinars and seminars that we do talk about that. So I'd say look back at those for a full in-depth idea, um, but it does depend on your area and generally most of the year, but fall is a wonderful time, of course, um, if you have any <laughs> insight on that one. Um, yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, the, they fruit in January, February, so that that's when we get a bunch in the, mm -hmm. in the nursery, um, just cause they, they're really pretty with fruit, but you can plant them any time of the year. Yeah. And, um, I also wanted to just kind of quickly talk about again, uh, for everyone that we have more webinars coming up about veggies and stuff. So we have our organic vegetable gardening with Dan Alexander. It's coming up this Saturday. It's at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. on September 9th. So definitely check that one out for, all the different kinds of vegetable gardening that's gonna be happening. It's each season's a little bit different. So it's always good to kind of see what's going on there if you're trying to get some vegetables and some fruits into your garden. Um, and then we were talking a lot about drought tolerant today and we have our water smart series with a partnership with Marin Water coming up on September 13th at 5 p.m. Another Wednesday class at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in, you know, saving a little bit of water but having still some good plants, um, I'm sure we're gonna go into a lot of talking there. And then we have, again, a fall planting class with Joan Pont on uh, September 16th at 10 a.m. So that's next week, uh, not this coming Saturday, but next Saturday. So more coming up too, right? We have lots of webinars coming. <laughs> we do. And I do want to say that the veggie one this weekend, actually, Taylor and I will both be back. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, be videoing <laughs> and then Taylor will be monitoring. But um, it's organic. It, he's going to go over organic veggie things, which is a slightly different or, organic veggie techniques which is slightly different from what he's done before so um it's a, a little bit of a different format which I'm looking forward to Dan knows like so much and we always learn from him so I recommend anybody that's doing vegetable gardening to um tune in yeah come with some good questions be ready to sit through some awesome discussions um Thank you again, uh, Jen, for putting on this awesome presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us today in the live recording. If you're watching this in the future, thank you for checking out our YouTube page or wherever you're watching it. Um, spread that knowledge around. We definitely want everyone to grow well and have a good time in their garden. Um, and join us and come visit our store, see what's going on. If you're in there around this week or this month, you know, coming for our sale. Um, but it'll be, have a wonderful rest of your uh, Wednesday, right? Thanks so much. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Mm-hmm.